Symposium on Host Genetic Response in COVID Pandemic Times, a boon or bane organized by the Indian Society of Human Genetics and Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology. Our first speaker of the day is Dr. Tom H. Carlson. He's currently the professor and head of the Division of Surgery, Inflammatory Diseases and Transplantation at the Oslo University Hospital in Norway. Dr. Carlson is also the full professor of internal medicine and Department of Transplanta Transplantation Medicine at the University of Oslo. He was a co-PI and senior author of the first genome-wide association study in COVID-19, published in New England Journal of Medicine in June 2020. Professor Carlson will be speaking to us about the application of genome-wide association studies to determine COVID-19 susceptibility and severity. We welcome you, sir. Thank you very much and thanks for the kind invitation. It's uh, nice to be with you, uh, even though only digitally here. Um, and thanks also for the nice introduction. I actually also work as a clinician and uh, we see COVID-19 patients uh, during our own calls uh, as we're also covering infectious medicine within our uh, division. So. Uh, I will share with you some um, experiences over the course of the last year, starting with uh, our own study and moving into the more uh, recent uh, publications. Um, as you would now all be familiarized, COVID-19 is a peculiar disease. And I think this is what struck us as clinicians uh, when we met these patients. Uh, they uh, of course, many of the patients remain as asymptomatic. They don't have very much of a problem. However, a few of the patients, a uh, variable fraction, uh, develops uh, a very specific and, and, and uh, strange clinical presentation that we hadn't really seen before. And um, coming from uh, the field of genome-wide association studies, uh, from uh, inflammatory diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory liver diseases, autoimmune diseases. I think that uh, um, appearance to us uh, in many ways reminded us of, a, of a, an autoimmune or auto-inflammatory disease. And we, we wanted to see if the application of the tools that we had been employing over the last decade could serve useful in clarifying the pathophysiology of this uh, syndrome. So what did we do? Uh, this is to show you uh, a little bit of the hectic that uh, was happening uh, at that time. It was uh, during the first wave of the pandemic in Europe, uh, late February and March uh, 2020. And as you may also know, the first countries to really uh, be hit by the pandemic in Europe was Italy and Spain. So whilst they were really busy handling their uh, COVID patients, uh, researchers in Norway and, and Germany, uh, we weren't too uh, busy at that time. We had the lockdown, we had restrictions, but we didn't really have too much of COVID patients. So we thought, okay, let's team up and uh, ask our Spanish and Italian colleagues to collect samples. And then we will do everything with re regards to analysis, genotyping, et cetera, et cetera. So we reached out to, uh, to colleagues in, uh, in various hospitals, mainly in Milan and, and uh, key Spanish cities. And over the course of the just a few weeks, we were able to collect um, uh, uh, DNA samples that uh, were subjected to genotyping by uh, standard <laughs> arrays. And... Uh, uh, running it through our standard analysis pipelines, which we were very familiarized with from previous studies, uh, in the end leading to, I would say, almost a record uh, three months from initiation of the study until the publishing of a complete genome-wide association studies for these patients. Um, I will come back more to the findings and just I just want to highlight a little bit the, the effort that went into this activity at this height of the first wave of the pandemic. You, you have had uh, severe uh, COVID uh, uh, waves in India, so you would all know this, uh, but this is the situation in the hospital. So under these circumstances, still the clinicians, uh, nurses, et cetera, engaged, 
uh, consented patients, which is not straightforward, many of them being uh, severely affected by respiratory uh, distress, uh, and collecting DNA samples uh, still uh, to allow us to do this study. Uh, this is just to show you the situation, and you would know this is the way it looks. This is actually the lobby of a hospital in uh, uh, in Madrid, and you can see that the lobby, there are the brick walls of the lobby, has been turned into an intensive care unit. They had 1,200 uh, COVID patients hospitalized uh, at that point in time. And um, the samples uh, were handled by engineers, transferred to Kiel, and you can see a little bit here the spirit of the project, which to me actually feels very important. Uh, here you can see the technicians in Milan labeling the, the boxes inside here. Everything is going to be all right. And uh, the receiving end had the same enthusiasm and spirit, working double shifts, weekends, etc., etc., to get this done. And finally, we had the samples uh, and we did the analysis. And I think that uh, it was quite clear that all these uh, efforts that went into this stress was recognized. This is what uh, New England told us. They felt this was a nimble effort, and I think it's a it's a fairly nice word to be used about this activity. This is the study population. I, I will show you this study population because it was a little bit of a mixed study population. What we thought we need to be pragmatic. We we couldn't really come with uh, twenty page questionnaires about various symptoms and 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 be be be. Uh, very detailed in our patient assessments. What we said, if you are on some form of oxygen supplementation, be that mechanical or just by nasal catheter or whatever, we want you in our study. Because then we felt that these were patients that had this peculiar lung disease that we were witnessing. But you can see that there is a variable intensity, uh, particularly in Milan, it was a very severe cohort. Most of the patients on mechanical ventilation, whereas if you go to some of the Spanish cohorts, they were milder patients, patients uh, very much on supplemental oxygen. And I think this actually was a, a strength of our study in the end. And I will show you why later on, uh, because it had a, a mixture of what I would say are just plain COVID cases, plus the very, very severe ones. The signal uh, that came out of this analysis uh, was uh, quite striking here for uh, chromosome 3. Uh, we had a, 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 a massive peak spanning six genes, and I will revert to these six genes later on. Plus, we had this signal at the ABO uh, locus on chromosome uh, 9. Uh, I think that there are some interesting geographical reflections that can be made upon this main finding, the chromosome 3 finding. Uh, here are the allele frequencies of the risk variants in, in Europe. Uh, and you can see two things from this diagram. First of all, uh, it's monomorphic in China. Uh, and I think that the, what we reasoned was that uh, the only reason why we were the first to publish on this risk locus was because there was no real uh, possibility of a signal to that uh, severity locus in China. Uh, even if they did a GWAS, they wouldn't find anything. And I will show you they didn't. Also, you can see here that in certain population groups, uh, uh, Southeastern Asia, uh, there are very high allele frequencies of this. And of course, blending this genetic background with uh, super high uh, risk uh, virus variants like the Delta variant, uh, you end up in a very dangerous situation. But you can see here, uh, this is actually a Wuhan GWAS. It ended up being published quite late, but I know that they were working over the uh, course of 2020. And you can see here, uh, because of this monomorphic situation for this risk locus, they didn't really have any findings. So they couldn't they couldn't have found this chromosome three locus uh, that we were able and so lucky to uh, uh, to detect in our data. I would say that there are two hypes that came out of this first publication, um, and um, one hype was um, the peculiar phenomenon that uh, this risk haplotype, the main risk haplotype actually seems to derive from uh, Neanderthals. Uh, and this received a lot of media attention. There was a nature paper even on this uh, phenomenon. Uh, however, in many ways, it's, it's actually not more peculiar than that the fact that we share a lot of uh, uh, genetic uh, background with the Neanderthals. I mean, there are numerous examples of uh, human phenotypes that are derived from the Neanderthal genome. I'll just here list a few of them. Of course, it's interesting to note that uh, 
there is a link here uh, uh, with genetic factors when it comes to uh, uh, the the interaction with Eurasian pathogens and 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 uh, and possibly there is an evolutionary background to the allele distribution that we see uh, for this variant throughout Asia and throughout uh, Europe. The second hype was the blood type hype. It was a massive hype. Everybody went around talking about their blood type and uh, COVID-19. We received a lot of media attention for this. Uh, patients kept writing us, so if I have blood type O, uh, I don't have to worry about COVID-19 or I don't have to take the vaccine, etc. It shows how difficult it is to communicate these GWAS outcomes to the lay public. And I think what we uh, tried to explain, uh, maybe necess not necessarily fully successful, was that what we were observing here was a biological phenomenon. And there were many plausible reasons why uh, uh, the blood type uh, O seemed to be uh, uh, protective against uh, COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, including uh, receptor binding, uh, coagulation uh, factors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, I think that much of this biological uh, nuances disappeared in this very black and white media attention that this uh, locus received. Um, and I would say it was almost a bit unfortunate because to us we always felt that there was a talking about the blood type, but actually our main finding and the, and a truly unique finding which hadn't been seen in any other phenotype before was actually the chromosome 3 finding. But this is just to show you then a little bit about the journey over the course of the year. This is the Manhattan plot from our analysis. And of course, we were very relieved, I have to say it that way, uh, when in September the 23andMe released their findings from um, their uh, analysis, uh, differentiating a little bit the chromosome uh, three findings, you can see that for the chromosome three finding, there seems to be a signal both in the susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, analysis and really mainly in the severity uh, uh, cohort. Whereas for ABO, it seems to be a signal for susceptibility to infection, but not really uh, when it comes to uh, disease severity. severity. And this actually also um, comes back to my point on why we were a little bit, I would say, lucky to, to include a, a spectrum of patients in our original analysis, a little bit of the most severe cases, but also some slightly milder cases. And that's probably why we were able to see both of these signals in our uh, uh, assessment. In October, there were uh, two uh, science papers from the Casanova lab in, 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 in New York. Uh, the one which has received the most attention is the one on uh, antibodies or autoantibodies to interferon signaling uh, uh, pathway components. However, to me and the paper that I wanted to highlight in this presentation is actually the, uh, the genetic assessment where they find that uh, uh, loss of function variants in uh, a series of genes, particularly in the interferon signaling pathways, seems to be associated with severe COVID-19. I think this is quite similar to what we see in a spectrum of human phenotypes that uh, for each and every phenotype on this instance, it would be COVID-19. There are these uh, uh, oligogenic or Mendelian phenocopies, whereas there is also the more uh, 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 complex representations. And uh, as I will come back to later on, uh, clearly, there is also a signal uh, in the uh, association analysis coming from particularly uh, IFN uh, R2, um, uh, first reported uh, by the genomic uh, uh, study. I think uh, you will have a, a specific lecture on this uh, study later on today. Um, in the background of all of this, uh, there was a wonderful initiative. I have to, I have to really uh, uh, boast about them. Uh, set up in Finland, uh, in Helsinki, by Mark Daly, a long-standing geneticist, uh, superstar of genetics, uh, and his team, Andrea Ganna, I would like to highlight particularly because he has been really a driving engine in this initiative. 
And uh, we were submitting data to this initiative. Uh, 23 and me were submitting data to this initiative. Everybody was submitting their summary statistics into this initiative. So it like, like, served like a, uh, a central meta-analysis uh, hub for all of these uh, GWAS. And I think that one of the key data releases, they just put their data in the beginning publicly available on the website. Uh, and I think one of the key launches was the November release where you can see that uh, on top of the replication of the chromosome 3 findings, plus uh, this nuancing of the ABO finding uh, into the susceptibility, into mainly a susceptibility signal, they were additionally ad identifying now more and more loci outside of these two primary regions. This was substantiated by the genomic study. Again, I think you will have more details on this study later on, so I will not go into uh, all of the all of the details of this study, uh, but you can see that uh, again here there starts to pop up signals in other regions uh, over and above this main chromosome three region. They don't really see any signal for ABO, and I think this is consistent with what we saw from the twenty three and me analysis. Uh, the ABO is a, is, is, a, is a risk locus for SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's not really a risk locus for uh, disease severity in COVID-19, on which this study was mainly uh, emphasizing. And then in July this year, we had uh, the final, or not the final, but a uh, 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 stick in the ground, so to say, flagship publication from this host genetics initiative. Uh, where you can see, again, really the substantiation of this chromosome 3 locus, uh, also showing, and I will come back to that, uh, a susceptibility uh, 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 effect on that locus. So possibly on this chromosome 3 locus, uh, there seems to be not only uh, 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 a genetic effect influencing uh, disease severity in COVID-19, but also a distinct and separate uh, effect uh, coupled with uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection susceptibility. And here you can again, you can see the ABO and you can see these non-chromosome uh, 3 loci popping up here and there, now amounting to a total of 13 uh, susceptibility loci for COVID-19, which I think is the public number of uh, risk loci at the moment as we speak. Mm -hmm. So what are we witnessing here? Um, again, those of us having worked in GWAS over the years uh, have, have seen this before. It's not something new. This is from inflammatory bowel disease, which has been one of my main research emphasis uh, over the years, where we had the, the landmark paper of NOD2 in 2001, which actually show, explains a little bit of the genetic variants of Crohn's disease, but certainly not all of it. And then there were subsequent uh, GWAS finding more and more and more genes, explaining more and more, however, only at incremental levels, uh, more, more lately, uh, of the genetic variants of the disease. And I think that's the way that I perceive this COVID-19 landscape of genetics too. There is the chromosome 3 locus, which to me as an IBD geneticist uh, is like the nod 2 of COVID-19. Whereas then on top of that, there are more and more additional loci. Uh, and I think this is also building on the general model of, of, of complex disease genetics. Certainly environment is the key factor in most of the uh, uh, complex diseases. In this instance, we know that environmental factor, it's SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, GWAS has allowed us to find uh, some of the genetic uh, influence. We have some Mendelian uh, cofactors, uh, but there is of course work remaining to be done. And this is also the background of the continuing efforts of the COVID-19 host genetics initiative. They're still uh, working, they're still uh, providing data updates, data releases, and there will be more low side. It's not stopping at 13, you will see more. And then comes the question, what does this mean in terms of biology? Uh, we started those speculations already back in June last year. There was an editorial with our paper. Um, and I can think you can, the way that it's being perceived at the moment, and this is coming back to the point that I made about uh, there being two distinct effects at the chromosome three locus. One, which is related to disease severity, which seems to maximize here on the cilium gene of set TFL1, but which is also very proximal to, uh, uh, to a cluster of uh, immune genes. Uh, whereas uh, when it comes to this susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 infection effect, 
it seems to more localize with this SLC 6820, which is actually a, a, a cofactor or co-transporter with ACE2, which is uh, linked with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 binding. So uh, clearly there is uh, work remaining to be done here. It will be very exciting to see the, the experimental data uh, which elaborates and dissects into this uh, genetic uh, landscape. And they are likely to be, to, to, to be arriving over the coming year or maybe even years, I, I would have to say. Looking at the, at the speed of translational activity and other GWAS outcomes, this is time-consuming work. If you take also, if you dwell with the chromosome three findings, I think this is actually a very uh, important paper. I would like to, uh, uh, I would encourage you to read it. It's it's a super nice paper showing really how this uh, genetic variant has an effect also clinically speaking. Uh, here you can see this, uh, the Kaplan-Meier plots for, for um, uh, patients with or without the risk variant. And actually, you can see, uh, because this is a debate we have with the clinicians, how relevant are these genetics for the, for the clinic? And actually, if you look at the overall population, the odds ratio for the, for the risk variant is not too far off many of the known clinical risk factors for severe COVID-19, like type 2 diabetes, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, etc. And particularly to the uh, right here, you can see that in the individuals below 60 years, this is a super strong effect. Actually, below 60 years, if you look at that population of severe COVID-19 patients, you, you will see that 30% uh, um, of the patients actually carry this risk variant compared to, I mean, six, seven, eight. 9% in the in the general population in Europe. So it, it's, it's a fairly strong effect. And I think possibly there is a place for this risk factor in uh, more compound assessment of, of uh, risk in, in these patients. And I think this is the way we should now look at this, um, uh, this risk map drawn by the genetic efforts over the past year. You have the main chromosome three finding, you have this uh, peculiar ABO association with susceptibility. Uh, but then you have also all of these other findings, which is now uh, the way that I perceive it, a translational gold mine uh, that needs to be scrutinized, uh, both with regards to uh, uh, potential uh, therapeutic applications, but also in understanding the development of this peculiar disease that we uh, started out with. And this is leaving me to basically the summary. This is where we started off. Uh, you have this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease uh, perspective. Um, we have now about a handful of susceptibility genes when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, and you have about the double of uh, uh, genes uh, involving in uh, disease severity, driving this peculiar lung affection that uh, was puzzling at us at the outset of the uh, uh, pandemic and which drove us into performing uh, these analyses. These are names that I want to highlight particularly in uh, coming from our own work. Uh, David, uh, first author of the paper, Andre, co-worker in genetics for many, many years in Kiel. He's put his lab to the disposal of this project and, and, and we did all the analysis as a priority. And many of these uh, co-authors and the drivers of this study are actually not working in infectious medicine. They are, some of them are liver doctors, etc. And you may ask why? And, and I think it's a little bit the same reason that we had for this geographical distribution of work in this project. We had time, they had patients, and their colleagues in intensive care, their colleagues in infectious medicine, they were overwhelmed. So, but they actually had time to do this collection. I think this is all in the end why we were able to do it so quickly. And we were coordinating it here, are some people from my group here, Johannes, Marit and Trine. And uh, with that, uh, I would leave you uh, 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 and thank you for the attention.